Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Now, we are going to be talking about the Western Federal Party called the Maverick Party. This is a party that has recently gone through a leadership election, was formerly led by the former government house leader under the Conservative Party, uh, Ms. Doc, the Honorable Jay Hill, and they crowned their first elected permanent leader this last weekend. On May 14th, members of the Maverick Party got together from Lower Mainland BC all the way to Manitoba and across the prairies. They came to Calgary, they listened to the new leader, they got the announcement, and without further ado, we're going to play the clip from the night. If you haven't watched it on YouTube, you're going to watch it now. But here is the Maverick Party crowning their new leader of the Maverick Party. Um, and as for the leadership results, I would like to congratulate Colin Krieger. He won the race at 52%. I bet you I can keep it under 10 minutes, although my wife would, would probably disagree with that. You know, uh, this has been uh, one thing came to light as I was traveling here today uh, via Facebook, of all things, of course. Uh, we found out that uh, today is actually the one year anniversary from the day that I was confirmed as a Maverick candidate in the federal election. That happened on May the 14th, one year ago today. It has been a crazy ride for me. I tell you what, I am honored to do this. There's so many people I have to thank that, that are, have been crucial in this process. Uh, of course, number one has to be my, my wife. <laughs> she is my rock. She absolutely uh, keeps everything at home, that, which allows me to be able to do this. It's great. Uh, I had a great team at home. Uh, my EDA guys are, are amazing. Uh, of course, it would be absolutely uh, remiss to not thank my campaign managing team of Carmen and Steve. They were great and uh, they, they've been just a, a huge, uh, like I just can't overstate their help enough. So what are we doing now? I talked about it during the campaign a lot. Now is the time to grow. Now is the time that I will commit myself full time to making sure that we grow. We need, we need more members than we've ever had before. I am committing myself to make sure that I am available at every step of this way to make that happen. My personal goal is to see 500 members in every EDA by the fall. And I'm gonna do everything I can. Let's do that. And then by this time next year, let's see if we can put a thousand members in every EDA. We do that and the Maverick Party is on the agenda. Everybody in Canada is going to know that we are serious and that we're going to win. Things are going to be different in Western Canada. Thank you, everybody. That's a wrap, folks. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, now that I've got Jay here, there is one other thing, and this is good. Now, if you go into my personal phone and you look for Jay Hill's uh, contact, it actually comes up as uh, Maverick Aristocracy. That's literally what it says in my phone. And Leah, of course, is part of that as well. And uh, I can never say enough to the structure, to the order, to the experience that you have poured into this party that has made it possible for guys like me and, and Tarek, of course, and oh man, how can I not say thank you to Tarek? Tarek is amazing. Everybody give Tarek a round of applause. 
Colin Carrick, as you just noticed, is the new leader of the Maverick Party, the only Western Federal Party that is in Canada. Now, if you haven't already, uh, I would say go back and listen to the interview that we did with Carrick, but I'm going to, uh, with Colin, but I want to just give you a heads up that later on in this episode, we're actually going to air the entire episode just in case you didn't hear it. So uh, just stay tuned and you'll hear then candidate, now leader, Colin, talk about his vision for the party and where they want to go. At the announcement at Big Rock Brewery down in Southeast Calgary, I had the chance to chat with Colin. I asked him if he would be willing to come back on the show. He did say yes. So I'm looking forward to actually sitting down with him in a future episode to talk about what he now has to do as the now crowned winner of the Maverick Party heading into 2025 when the next general election is expected to have because of the supply agreement the NDP and the Liberals have together. So we have a lot to discuss today and we have a lot to chat about. But before we do, I want to take a quick commercial break and I just want to go go to the commercial break. and We'll be right back with my in-depth analysis of what happened and where the party needs to go. Chat to you soon. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. The Maverick Party is a unique party. They're relatively young if you look at the grand scheme of things. In 2020, the Maverick Party started... Then leader Jay Hill came out of retirement and got some of his former colleagues, uh, Leon Benoit, Verdith Merth, and they got together and they formed this party, the Maverick Party, because they were sick and tired of hearing time, time, and time again that the Conservatives and the Liberals were just taking for granted the Western provinces and they would not traditionally campaign out here because they would traditionally campaign in Toronto, Montreal, Lower Mainland BC because that's where the vote rich areas are. So they would traditionally forget about it and when it came to the House of Commons sittings and voting, they would traditionally try to buddy buddy up with Quebec and they would then forget about Western Canada. One of the things that came out during the election was the realignment of seats in on uh, in Canada from 338 to 342. So an additional five seats were up for play. What had happened was Quebec was actually expected to lose a seat. And Alberta, Ontario, and I believe BC were all expected to gain uh, one in BC, one in Ontario, and three in Alberta. Bloc Quebecois was not happy about this. They put forward a motion where they said, we do not want to lose a seat. We potentially even want to gain a seat. Uh, Put the motion forward. Ten Western MPs, including members of the Conservative Party of Canada, voted for this measure. This took a really big turn, and the Mavericks pounced. During one of their events that they had up in Airdrie, uh, Tariq Anelga, who was the runner-up in the campaign, who ran for Banff, in Banff Airdrie against Blake Richards, the MP, uh, in the last 2020 uh, one election, uh, they did talk about it. They did mention it. They were not happy about it, but they were also not happy with Pierre Polyev, the cons- the heir apparent, the perceived front runner of the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership uh, race that there's currently going on. And the reason I say that is because he abstained from the vote and Tariq, uh, God bless him, he jumped on that, uh, Tariq, sorry, uh, he jumped on that really quickly and he did not let it go. And even Colin was al- also talking about it as well. So you had two Western Canadians who were very upset that the Conservatives were being chummy chummy to go back and not remembering that their core support, the Conservative Party, is Western Canada. If you looked at the map in 2021, you saw all 14 seats in uh, uh, Saskatchewan go Conservative. You saw in Alberta, out of the 32, uh, I believe 29 went 
conservative. Nope, sorry, sorry, 28 went conservative. Four did actually go two for the NDP, two for the Liberals. So they are expected to now, in the last election, they only ran, the Maverick Party, I should say, the Maverick Party only ran 32 seats in 32 ridings last election because they didn't want to split the vote and potentially see the Liberals or the NDP uh, go up the middle. But since then, and now with the new leader, with Colin, it it is looking like that they are going to run a, ride, a candidate in every riding across Western Canada. One of the big things that they mentioned during that uh, election announcement, leadership announcement on Saturday, was in Manitoba, there's a gentleman, I didn't catch his name, and if he's listening to this, please reach out. I'd love to have you on to talk about Western politics, and especially in Manitoba. Um, they mentioned that they have a riding association up and running in all 14 ridings in Manitoba. This is a big deal. During the last election, they, Manitoba, I think if I'm not mistaken, had one or two candidates for the Maverick Party. So now that they have 14 riding associations up and running, this is going to be an election and a momentum that is going to be building. Maybe in Saskatchewan's next, then Alberta, then BC, and then the three territories. But we're going to see the Mavericks start building strong. We go back to what he said, and I mentioned a little bit earlier. Colin wants 500 members in each riding association by the fall. He also has pledged, he hopes, to see 1,000 members in each riding association by this time next year. And the reason he said that, as it is alluded to in his speech that he gave in front of the packed house, was if you have a membership of a thousand people in every riding or close to a thousand, you're going to be taken seriously. You're going to actually be taken serious in the idea that people are fed up with the mainstream politics. They're upset with the Conservative Party. They're upset with the Liberal Party. Let's be honest, everyone's upset with the Liberal Party in Western Canada right now. They're upset with the NDP. They're upset with the uh, Greens. So if the Mavericks can actually achieve this goal of a thousand members by this time next year, they might actually be able to win a few seats. Now, I had Eric Grenier, Grenier on the show, the writer of The Red, he former uh, uh, analysis of CBC. He said that this last election was their election to potentially make some gains. I'm going to kind of contradict him here a little bit, and I do that out of just sheer, like, my views against his views. The Reform Party was not a was not a well-known party in 1988. They did not win any seats. A by-election came along in 1989. And who happened to win? Former guest of the show, Deborah Gray. Deborah Gray decided to run real in re-election after the uh, candidate who won in 1988 died uh, from a heart attack. And she ran, she won, and she was off in Ottawa. It takes one person to make an avalanche. Because that one person, Deborah, she then, in 1993, we all know what happened, 52 seats later, barely, almost, taking official opposition, but the Bloc Quebecois actually did that with 54 seats. So, the Mavericks have a big, big role to play in the next few weeks, next few years, I should say. If they can get what Colin wants done by next year this time, they potentially could pick up one, two, three seats. And if they pick up one, two, three seats, it takes a little bit of a like break in the glass to actually see everything start falling down. If they win one seat, the next election they win two, it could happen. And I, and I mean that with sincerity because we, we are seeing the rise of more and more people not wanting to vote, not being engaged. And if Colin can tap into that engagement, that, that, that anger that Western Canadians are feeling against, whether it be Pierre, whether it be John Charest, whether it be Patrick Brown, whether it be Justin Trudeau, they can make gains. And I'm not counting them out any time soon because... I feel like if we did, it would be doing a disservice to the people who voted from the last election, which I know there wasn't a lot, but for a party that only had 
one year, 32 candidates, they did quite well. Let's put it there. So I'm looking at where the party is going and this idea that if we get 500 memberships in by fall, 1,000 by next year, as Colin said it best, they are a force that should not be ignored. Um, will Pierre Polyev's uh, campaign or leadership, if he wins, change that? I don't know. Um, I don't know that, and I hope... Colin can get out and actually tour the country, meet with the Canadians from Manitoba to Saskatchewan to Northwest Territories to the Yukon to Iqaluit, all over the country. I'm just hoping that he does, because if he does, he has a great shot of being elected as a MP in Ottawa for Western Canada. So I'm going to be right back after a brief message, and then I'll come back for the introduction of the interview that I did with Colin back in April. So we'll be talk right soon. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. So like I said, we are back and we are going to be airing the episode that we did with Colin, the new leader of the Maverick Party when he was the candidate running in the leadership of the Maverick Party. So if you haven't already, please stay with us the entire time. It is about a 45 minute interview and we'll be right back after that and then we'll wrap up and we'll talk about where we're going to be hopefully having a chat with uh, Colin later on. So talk to you soon. Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and today I am honored and pleased to have our guest on. He is currently crisscrossing Western Canada, running for the leadership of the Maverick Party, and that is Colin Krieger. Colin, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so, Colin, uh, I ask, I start all interviews off the exact same way. You are no exception because you're a politician. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? I have, I am a parent, and I'm just becoming more and more concerned that we uh, need to make some major changes in Western Canada, and if I have the ability to do so, then it is it's my duty to do so. And so I am a, I'm a dad, I'm now a, a grandparent and uh, I wanna do it. Um, yeah, it's important to me. Now, uh, before we get into some policy questions, let's learn a little bit more about Colin and who Colin is. <laughs> um, politics is a strange beast to get into. It is a, a unique elephant in itself. Where did politics come from for you? Have you always been interested in politics? Was politics something that was discussed at the family table as a young boy? What, where did politics come from for you? I've always been involved in, not involved, pardon me, interested in politics, just like you said. I've always uh, just thought that it was extremely interesting and important. I followed it avidly uh, ever since I was a teenager. Uh, and I don't come from a long line of politicians or anything like that, but it was always something that I've been really interested in, in doing so. And so uh, how I specifically myself got involved was uh, uh, about a little over a year ago now, uh, a, a good friend of mine who is involved in the Maverick Party in this local area up here in the uh, Peace River Westlock riding, uh, approached me and said, hey, you know, we're looking for candidates to run in the next federal election. And I said, no, thanks. <laughs> Quite honestly, I told them no. And uh, so I, uh, but just by, they they swear up and down that they weren't co collaborating or anything, but another good friend of mine who is also involved in the Maverick Party called me uh, like within a couple of weeks and said, Colin, you know, I got an email saying that uh, we're looking for candidates for the Maverick Party, and I really think that you should do that. Well, then that that took me back a little bit, and I had to reconsider my position. And uh, at the time, I uh, there was other uh, nominees for the candidacy position, and I thought, well, you know, I I didn't honestly know if I would if I would win the the nomination, but I ended up uh, becoming the candidate, and 
thing led to another, and here we are. So what drew you to the Maverick Party? Because before anyone decides to run for a party, you, while your friends can entice you to run, you want to look at their policies and who they are and what they stand for. What aligned with your values when you decided to run in that 2021 election that you said, you know what, the Maverick Party and I, we align on so many issues and I want to run because of that. What were those issues? Well, for me, it's it's the sense that Western Canadians just simply don't have a voice in Confederation, in Canadian Confederation. We are uh, muted at best, uh, ignored at worst on so many different issues. You know, if, if as if our interests align with Eastern interests, then we will often get it. But um, on so many different things, whether it be energy policy or uh, any of these other types of policies that would uh, unfairly target the West, uh, you know, and, and that has been something that has bothered me for a really long time. So I, that is primarily the idea. When I heard the Maverick uh, platform being a regional platform and how that that could work in order to give us that clear voice in Ottawa without having to worry about what uh, other parts of the country thought of the things that we need, that really spoke to me. And it made me realize that the, the Maverick message was kind of a, a perfect fit for where I see Western Canadians uh, go in the future. Now, you, you talk about energy policy, and I was going to wait till later on, but let's let's dive into it, because the energy is one of the big things that a lot of Western Canadians, particularly here in Alberta, are concerned about. As a man who has worked in the oil and gas sector, who would be leaving a job in the oil and gas sector if you win this uh, race, what are you hearing from the people in the oil and gas sector about what's happening in Ottawa and how unfair they're being treated here in Alberta? Uh, it's the hypoc the hypocrisy is the part that drives us crazy. On one hand, they 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 want to uh, talk about this dirty industry that we have. Uh, the oil and gas, you know, is something that's a thing of the past, and we're going away from it. But all of the facts say that we're going to continue to need the world will continue to need oil and gas for the next 40 to 50 years, which is two generations of workers. You know, like we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, a way that we can help the world with our clean energy. And yet we're being told that it's dirty and not worth having around. And we are as Westerners denigrated for from, from the East. And yet everything that they use every day is made from petrochemical products. You know, we're like, you know, everybody wants to focus on, on the gas you put in your car because that's the cost that comes out of our pocket. But even our iPhones, the steel, you know, everything uses, you know, fossil fuels of some sorts. And so uh, that hypocrisy is what drives us crazy. I, I, I like the word hy hypocrisy that you use because... Earlier last week, which as of airing would be this week when we're actually recording this, um, the Liberal government announced a new mining, or sorry, not a new mining, a new oil expansion in Newfoundland and Labrador. That would not be seen here in Alberta because the seats are in Newfoundland who would vote Liberal. Is the Liberal government with Justin Trudeau's Prime Minister pitting East versus West in this anti-oil crusade against the Alberta oil sands? I don't think it's just in regards to that. I think that the divisive nature of the liberal government and their ideology is, is apparent throughout. It's on so many different things, whether it be race or, or even religion sometimes, or uh, or the oil and gas policies. There's so many different ways that we are being pitted against each other. And this lack of unity is another thing that's a big thing for me. I, as, as a Western Canadian, I want to see all Western Canadians of all cultures, of all uh, 
ages and working histories uh, to be unified and working together into the future. And I think the Maverick platform is, is one that can accomplish that for Western Canadians. And that's another reason why I love the platform. So you, you're crisscrossing uh, Western Canada right now. You were in BC, if I'm not mistaken, earlier this month. You're you were doing you are in Alberta a few times. Well, you live in Alberta, so you're here in Alberta a few times. Um, what are you hearing? We we talked about the oil and gas sector uh, sector and the hypocrisy that you're hearing from the workers with the what's going on in Ottawa. But the I don't want to say average day to day person in Western Canada. But what are you hearing from? Western Canadians and what, how can you address it? Uh, frustration, if I had to pick a single word, it's probably frustration. Uh, and it can manifest in a lot of different ways. Uh, I, I hear it uh, quite often that from people that just say they wanna separate, they believe in Western independence. Uh, you see that a lot in Alberta and a lot in Saskatchewan, um, although not only there. I've heard that also in BC when I was there. They just There's a lot of people that just don't see uh, confederation as something worth fighting for anymore. But that isn't across the board. I see, uh, I see also people that just want to see our position inside of our provinces to be strengthened to the point where we can push back federal overreach on a host of different issues. And so the frustration is, is prevalent, but how they express it is, is different depending on just, it, I don't think it's even regional. It's just depending on who you're talking to. Um, even age groups can make a difference with that. I was out at the uh, Airdrie AGM that was held here in, I believe it was early, late March, where you and Tariq both gave a speech. I took some photos there and I listened to both of you speak. And I was I was impressed by what you said that uh, on, on this topic of Western separation, Western autonomy, you talked about how you had to get it right. You had to get it right because you had one really good shot of doing it. And Right now, as you said, if you talk to people up in, say, rural Alberta, rural Saskatchewan, their opinions are going to be different from what you hear in Edmonton, Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon. So how do you approach a leadership where you have one half saying, we're looking at autonomy, we're looking at independence, where you're saying, okay, we have to take this cautiously because if we do it wrong, we will screw it up for potentially anything in the future of us getting it right. Exactly, and and uh, thank you for that synopsis. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I don't remember saying it quite that well, but it's, you're you're right on the money. So, just to be absolutely clear, uh, I am not uh, of the opinion where I think that Alberta needs to stay, or any of the provinces need to stay. I. I believe that if the Western provinces wanted to become independent, that it would be a good thing. So I need to put that out there first, but this is also true. I don't represent everybody in, in Canada. There are a multitude of different opinions on this particular subject. But what I think that we could all agree on is that the amount of uh, interference from Ottawa in Western Canadian politics is, is obscene. We have to, as provinces, we have to encourage our provincial leaders to start using the powers that they have available to them to start pushing back to halt this um, intrusion into our, uh, what are traditionally, and, and according to law, uh, our, our provincial, jurisdictions. And so the, the Maverick position and mine would be, let's work on those. Um, so inside of all of this, you know, there's a little bit of terminology that you could throw around with it all. One of them would, would be like autonomy. And when I talk autonomy, usually I'm talking about things that would happen inside of confederation, but would strengthen the province's position 
and give them back the power that they deserve. And when I talk about positions of autonomy, I would talk about things like um, having our own police force. I believe that, uh, that we should have, uh, every Western province should have their own provincial police force. Um, and it's not that I don't like the RCMP or that I think that they do a bad job. It's just that I think that they are of a split uh, allegiance. They are a federal police force, even though they're paid for the, by the provinces. I think that Western Canadians should be policed by Western Canadians. So that is a layer of autonomy. Another one would be getting rid or stepping away pension plan. That's another thing that I think would be great for Western Canadians. We should be uh, uh, starting our own provincial pension plans and I think it would be much better for our citizens. So those are examples of autonomy that that our provinces frankly do right now. They don't need permission. In fact, other provinces like Quebec already have those types of measures in place and working well for them. I believe that uh, the Western provinces should also uh, bring those things into, you know, into bearing, like they should happen. So uh, now there are other things that are, you know, that are not autonomy issued and are certainly not things that the province can do by themselves. Uh, those things would require constitutional changes, like, um, for instance, the equalization payments system. That has to be changed. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. think you so, could change it though because, and i'm not no. trying to play devil's advocate here because <laughs> quebec and ontario will <laughs> will fight tooth and nail to keep that equalization right. payment in place so as much as we mm -hmm. want to go in and change it right. our system is screwing us over where the two largest provinces with the largest populations get the bigger votes <laughs> Correct. And, and you're right. And so that's why I want to make the distinction between uh, autonomous things that the provinces can do right now and, and then these other things that the West could really use, like getting rid of equalization. Um, but they require constitutional change, which makes them, frankly, difficult to the point of being impossible because of the political will isn't there from the rest of the country. And then we, of course, come to the, the, the separation issue, right? Or the independence issue. And that is where, you know, uh, Western Canadians would decide province by province that they wish to have a vote and decide whether or not they are going to remain within confederation or to become independent. At that point, they would have, you know, should that measure pass, should that vote that referendum pass, then they would be in a position of power to negotiate on those other constitutional issues. Because right now, like you said, we don't have we don't have the the power or the negotiating position to really make those things happen, like you like you said. We we talk about uh, Western ideology, Western values, sort of the autonomy that we can do right now. I want to get on the record from you. What are Western values? Because there might be people here listening to this in Eastern Canada, and I know they are not your voting base. So really, why they're listening? Hey, welcome to the show. But uh, this is for a Western audience. What would you say are Western values that Eastern Canadians don't understand our Western values. And, and this, is a, this is a bit of a tricky one because, you know, there are obviously going to be people in other parts of the country. And, the, you know, it's not like we have a patent, uh, a patent on, these, on these values. 
but they are predominant within Western Canadian culture. In my opinion, uh, uh, having grown up here for my whole life, uh, having raised kids, grandkids, you know, uh, my, my great grandfather uh, homesteaded in this area back in the 1930s. Oh, wow. And this, yeah, right? Like, you know, I'm, uh, those guys knew how to work. You know what? <laughs> I, I don't live terribly far from the old original homestead. And uh, I've, I've tried to, you know, uh, break land uh, without big equipment and it's hard work. So I respected all those old guys. But that I is respect them now. Work. I respect the farmers of today because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to get up the crack of dawn and do what they do. So God bless the Canadian no. farmer as well. <laughs> no kidding. So, but I think it's a cultural thing. And this is how I describe it is that uh, in other parts of the country, they may want to describe culture as, as having a common history. But here in the West, we, we're not really that old. You know, like, Alberta and Saskatchewan became part of Confederation in 1905, you know, and, and so when we have culture here, I think it's more of a common mindset. And I think it's because we have a living memory of a lot of those old pioneering guys. And that's where our hard work ethic comes from. I think that that's where our get or done ethic comes from. I, I think that that is where um, honesty and integrity meant something. Uh, and if you, if you look back at those guys, they were risk takers. We often describe the Western Canadian, uh, one of our idiosyncrasies is that we can be risk takers. But all of those old timing pioneers that came here, they took a risk. They had a common mindset. They didn't know what they were getting themselves into, really. They came all the way over here uh, with just what they could carry, really. And then just had the mindset that if they worked hard enough, if they worked long enough, and that they would be rewarded for it. And by and large, they were. It was not an easy life but they, they created a good life for themselves. And I think that we still have a uh, kind of a cultural memory of that. And that is a part of our culture. That's what makes us different in the West as opposed to other parts of the country. And uh, I, I think it's worth commenting on and I think it's worth um, thinking about. So that's, I would identify as a Western Canadian set of values. We we talk. We talk. Sorry, that was a long much. answer. No, I I, <laughs> I like long answers because it makes the makes an interview great. Um, we talked about the conservatives for a few minutes at the beginning of the interview, but I want to dive into it a little bit deeper because. I heard a lot during the last election. I can't, I, I would love to vote for the Maverick Party, but I want to keep Justin Trudeau out. The split voting, I'm assuming you heard it up in Peace River Westlock during your time running there. How do you overcome that going forward? Because you, you're still an upstart party. This will be your second election that you'll be contesting in 2025 if it doesn't get called before then. How do you get Albertans, Saskatchewans, Manitobians, uh, British Columbians to actually say, you know what, we're going to stick with the Maverick Party this time because I, we just can't continue to vote for the same thing and expect a different result? Yeah, you're right. We, we hear this all the time. And if, for instance, I heard it just the other day, I was in in uh, the Edmonton area getting the oil changed in my pickup truck. As you can imagine, it's been seen quite a few miles and it was time. So I went in there and uh, the young man that, that took my truck into, into the dealership, uh, inputted it into the system, looked at the kilometers, looked at the last time the oil was changed and said, wow, what do you do? You know, so I, I told him what I was, I'm running for the leadership of Maverick Party and he recognized it. And he said, oh, that's great. I says, I love the Maverick Party. I, I think that that's a, they have a great platform. And I, so I asked him, do you have a membership then? He says, oh, no, I don't think I could get involved until you're bigger. 
until you have more, you know, you have more members or something. And I, I looked at them and I kind of gave them one of these and I said, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing you got going on there. Like, uh, you, you know, you have to have people join if you want to get bigger. And he, he laughed and uh, whatever, we, we talked a little bit more about that. But right now, what I've been telling people is forget about splitting the vote. According, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the, the liberal NDP semi-formal coalition, whatever you want to say about it, they've given us a terrible gift. We have time. I'm not asking anybody to vote right now. Of course, there's no vote to be had in the near future. Well, what there's a vote I'm for our leadership. To... Uh, yeah, well, okay, for me, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean a federal, a general that, federal election. Agreed. Okay, I agree. I just wanted to, to throw clear. that right. out there. You know people I mean. do need yeah, to buy a membership yeah. to vote for you. Yeah. Right. 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 I don't. Yeah. Do you need a job? No, I'm teasing. So it's a good. You're right. So what I said though to him was, I'm not. There's no federal election. Just to be clear, there's no federal election. So I said, if you like the Maverick Party, just join. Join it because you like the platform, I said. And the reason why that's important is because the membership numbers are open. Uh, you know, they're reportable to Ottawa. So if Ottawa sees a growing membership list, they're, they're realizing that things are changing in Western Canada, right? What, what the Conservatives will realize is that uh, we can no longer ignore the Western Canadian. You know, we can't just, you know, count on their votes time after time without, you know, giving them any, cons you know, with giving them any attention after the election, basically. Um, you know, the liberals, the liberals will be especially concerned by that because, you know, the liberals are happy when we vote conservative time after time. They have a game plan and they, they implement it and it works and they win elections. They don't actually care if we vote liberal here in the West. So long as we all vote conservative, they have a game plan. So when people buy Maverick membership, we're telling the liberals that we're no longer going to abide by the status. We're going to ask for something different. We, we will not play by the same rules anymore. So when I talked to that young man, that's what I told him. And, uh, that's why buying a membership is so important. So we have time to grow. In regards to the vote splitting, my goal for every riding is to grow the membership to thousands. My goal would be to have 5,000 members in every riding across Western Canada. If we had 5,000 members, we would probably win the riding. And at that point, come the next federal election, it won't be the conservatives saying, don't split the vote. It'll be us. It'll be saying the Mavericks are the ones who have been working hard. The Maverick party is the one that wants to properly represent you in Ottawa. The Maverick party will be the one that gives you that voice that won't be muted, that won't be diluted and, and don't split the vote because the Mavericks, you know, have done the work for you. And that, that's, my, that's my message right now, really, is because of this, this time that we have been given, if we use it wisely, then we can, uh, we can make a difference. One of the things that I heard during the last election, and it particularly right after the election, was I wish the Mavericks had a candidate in my riding. I wish that they had ran a candidate every single riding. I know uh, the now interim leader, Jay Hill, said we don't want to split the vote. We're going to run in traditionally safe conservative ridings. I, I'm gonna, I, I asked this to Tariq. I'm going to ask this to, uh, point blank to you, too. If you win, would you guarantee that every Western Canadian has the ability to vote for a Western, a Maverick Party candidate in the next election if they want it to? That's the goal. Now, that being said, uh, we will make sure that every candidate that we have is a quality candidate. That's my caveat to that statement. Uh, I'm, 
I won't parachute candidates into writings. I won't, uh, I won't just accept a candidate based on an email. Uh, I know that has happened in other parties. I won't do it. Uh, we, we want to make sure that if that candidate does get elected uh, into the parliament, that he's, he or she, uh, forgive me if I do that, by the way, I don't know why I have this here tick and it was pointed out to me. I often say he, and it's not that I'm not sensitive, but there's plenty of extremely talented um, lady uh, MPs out there that I would, you know, would be a welcome addition into the Maverick party. So don't, if I say that a lot, please forgive me. Well, I didn't notice it uh, until you pointed it out. So that's how okay. much. Well, so. I noticed myself because <laughs> okay. it was pointed out to me once before. So I, I'm trying to be aware of these things uh, as I speak. So forgive me, but uh, one of the things, and, and there's a reason why I say that we have to be so careful. Um, one of the things is, is that in regards to that MP, there is uh, the term called backbenchers, right? In, in the House of Commons, there'll be backbenchers. And a backbencher to me is somebody who has the seat that sits in the seat, but doesn't control his own vote or her own vote. That is simply another vote that the leader has at their disposal. And that is not right. That, uh, that is not democratic in my point of view and will never happen in the Maverick party. We are not gonna have the party whip, if you, wanna, if you know the term. Yeah. Uh, we will not be controlling our, our MPs votes. Uh, we expect them to vote however their constituents which wish them to vote. And so from that point of view, the Maverick Party will never have a backbencher. And so I expect them to be talented. I expect them to be gifted communicators. I expect them to be very good listeners. And I expect them to have uh, uh, wisdom so that when they are in their writings, when they are uh, getting to know their constituents, that when there is a vote in the House of Commons, that they will be able to exercise that vote in a responsible manner on behalf of their constituents. So uh, my goal is, is to have a, uh, an MP or a, or a candidate, I should say a Maverick candidate in every writing, but it will be, um, it will be based on being able to find those candidates and having them properly vetted and so that we are setting ourselves up for success as a party and and as representatives so how do you do that how do you express western uh issues when the issues in bc are not going to be the same in Alberta are not going to be the same in Manitoba, are not going to be the same in Saskatchewan. And even if you want to go locally, the issues here in Calgary are not the same issues up in Peace River, Westlock. So how do you get a party together who have independent minds, but also advocating for the best interest of all Western Canada? Because it seems like a very tricky tightrope you'd have to walk there. It's true. And of course, behind closed doors, uh, the Mad Party Caucus is probably going to have some extremely lively debate, I suspect. We're, we're going to be hashing these things out, trying to make sure that we are um, operating within our, our policies and our guidelines, because that will be the framework that we work out inside of, right? No matter how you vote, it needs to be consistent with the policies and the guidelines of the Maverick Party. Right. No matter, you have to be able to justify your vote based on that because that's the platform that you were elected on. So now you're right, it could be tricky because you're, you know, on some things, there's going to be no, no dissent. Everybody wants a balanced budget. We can all vote on that one. I think that, well, yes, we all want a balanced budget. That's, that's something we would agree on. Now, uh, if it was firearms legislation, there would be more debate, I suspect. 
from an inner city type of a riding to a, a rural riding. And uh, we would talk about a lot of things on that particular issue. We would talk in regards to firearms issues being more in regards like a property rights thing instead of actually being about the gun itself. It would be more about property rights and we would address it in that manner. So even though there is the potential for having the odd split vote, even within the party, I still think it's worth it because that's democracy. That is how the country is supposed to be run. So you have, I'm just, I'm just cautious of time here. We're about uh, 35 minutes mm. into this interview and I just want to make sure that we get a, a lot in. Uh, I, I should have asked this question before we started talking about policy, but eh, let's do it now because that's the great thing about my show. I get to put the questions wherever I want to. Um, <laughs> you've decided to put your name forward for the leadership of the Maverick Party. If elected on May 14th, you will be the first permanent leader of the party. Why did you do that? Why did you put your name forward? What about you makes you believe you would be the best leader to lead this party into the future? I have a track record of being a good team builder. That is probably one of my strongest skill sets is being able to understand where people are coming from, uh, being able to uh, see different perspectives, making sure that everybody is put in the right spot. And that is going to be, I think, especially at this point in time, crucial to the Maverick Party. When we are going from this, um, this stage of, of uh, a brand new party to becoming that next step into a well-organized, hopefully well-oiled machine into the future uh, where we can um, inspire confidence uh, with our electorate that they're not, they don't feel like they're, they're taking a chance, but they're voting for something that they actually believe in. And so my goal, and, and I, I believe I have the skill set needed to do that, to build that team uh, and, and work with the people that are there already and, and bring in new people to, uh, to make sure that when we're ready, when that next election is called. You have a lot of work ahead of you for the next few weeks before the, um, oh, oh, did I interrupt you? Did I'm sorry. I cut I, out on you? Yeah, you cut out there. So I'll let you continue before I ask my next question there. Sorry. Okay. I, I was just going to say, and, and age might have a little bit to do with it too. I am, like I said before, I'm a grandfather and I've had some time to develop um, uh, just some of those skills over time. And I think that now is the time where I have enough. Uh, it's just the right time of life for me to be able to do this, uh, where I everything just seems to line up perfectly that I can take on this job and devote my full attention to it. It means leaving the area quite often. You you will have to travel to Manitoba, Saskatchewan. I, I saw via your uh, social media pages that you're going to be in Saskatchewan in a, a few days. Um, and you'll be in BC. This is a lot of time away from home. Uh, are you ready to get out there and actually do the hard work? Because I think a lot of party members would be looking at the new leader and saying, if you're just going to stick to Alberta, then I want I want someone who's going to represent all of Western uh, Canada, not just mm -hmm. Alberta and Saskatchewan, where it may be easier to find Maverick voters. Do you think you are up to the challenge to go into Chilliwack, to go into mm -hmm. Dauphin, Manitoba, to find those Maverick Party supporters and speak to the to to disenfranchise conservatives? liberals because you can't just win with the disenfranchised conservatives you have to win with a coalition of people do you think you can do it yeah i frankly without uh, i think i'm working on proving it right now i have been uh working to get out there as much as possible um i, I gotta be fair about this too like i have four kids 
of, of my own, uh, but they're all grown up and out of the house now, and I'm very proud of them. Uh, they're all making their way. I, I often joke about uh, that which one of them is the black sheep, and I haven't been able to figure it out yet. So they're all good, but I am also a foster parent. Uh, my wife and I, about six years ago, decided that we would get involved in, in the foster parent program. And uh, we have three awesome uh, siblings in our care right now. And they've been in our care now for three and a half years. And they will remain in our care um, probably until they're all adults. It's not common within the foster care system, but it's the way that this is going. So I actually had to talk with the foster care system prior to me accepting this, uh, this leadership bid, because uh, I, can't, I can't sacrifice my home, my, my kids or anything here for this. Uh, you know, there are priorities, but we have looked after them. I can do it. Uh, my wife and, and my kids supporting my wife, my adult kids supporting my wife, which are great. Uh, makes this a lot easier for me. They they soak up the balance while I'm gone. I will be traveling a lot since the middle of oh shoot, I gotta remember it'd be probably March. I've put on about twelve thousand kilometers since then, since the middle of March already. I've done many many trips up and down the length of Alberta, stopping in numerous ridings. Uh, we went one trip, as you had mentioned before, where we went up through the north part of British Columbia and then went down the center and ended up all the way down in the Soyuz uh, and back up across to Crow's Nest. And then here in Alberta, we are planning another trip into uh, Saskatchewan here shortly, as you said. I plan on doing this until the next election, if necessary. Now, the good news about today's technology is that as you and I are doing, we're, you know, we're six or eight hours of driving apart, and yet we still can talk face to face. And so we will be using this type of technology as well to make sure that we are keeping in touch with all of our, our uh, people that we need to uh, doing meetings as, as often and, uh, you know, as, as, as necessary. And so, uh, Although I got to be honest, I prefer face to face. If I have to drive six or eight hours to do a face to face meeting, I'd rather do it. But uh, I just you think and there's me both, value Matt. to that. You and me both. I miss the in person. Which is next time we do this, can we say that? That next time we'll just all come and see you. Yes, we will. I, hey, I, I, from what I understand, the Maverick Party is holding a leadership debate here in Airdrie at the end of the month, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, the 28th. Or the 27th? 7th, I think. So, yeah. hey, if you're, if you're listening to this, which this episode comes out on the 27th of April, if you're listening to this on the 27th <laughs> of April, head out to Airdrie, I think it's the golf course, if I'm not mistaken, and attend the right. debate. The links will be in the show notes. So, hypothetically, go out, listen to both Tariq and Colin. <laughs> I'm assuming you'll both be there in person. Yes, sir. So go out and meet Colin and Tariq, both leadership candidates. Um, <laughs> my last question for you is this, because I guarantee you someone up in Slave Lake who probably listens to this show more than I listen to my own show uh, is yelling at their car radio right now, driving from Slave Lake to High Prairie because they usually send me a message saying, why didn't you ask this question? Or someone driving from Saskatoon to Regina or somewhere in Western Canada wants to reach out to you and ask a question that we didn't cover in this last 45 minutes. Where would they do that? How would they get in touch with you? Uh, well, there's a couple of different ways. You can, uh, the best way is to, on Facebook, go to uh, my Colin Krieger Maverick Party page. You can do so there. Uh, I have a website, which is www.colinkrieger.ca, pretty easy. Uh, my my uh, email address is similar, just info at callingfigure.ca. And uh, you can try any of those things. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, Krieger Colin, I think, is my Twitter handle. 
pretty pretty easy. So I, I try and make myself uh, available to everybody. And here's one that maybe it's on my card. So I'm going to share it here too. If you want to call me, you can. 780-524-8807. Send me a text. And yeah, 524-8807. For those who have listened to the show before or followed along uh, while watching this, the links to Colin's information are in the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, scroll down, the information's there. If you're listening to this on your car or radio, pull over. Then you can check the information. <laughs> do not text and drive. <laughs> as much as we all want to try and do it, don't. I had someone die from a uh, distracted driver, so please don't. Um, Mm. Colin, my last question to you this is, because I said that was the last question, but this is the actual last question. What? Uh, actually, I'll ask this question. I'll, I was going to ask a different question, but I'm going to ask this question instead. Oh. You no. are... <laughs> no, no, just no, just no. <laughs> why Here's should people COVID. join the Maverick Party of... Well, why should not people join the Maverick Party and support you? I think that we can take this to the next level. I think that we can take the Maverick Party and we can get to the place where we can be proud of our leaders. Integrity means stuff. Integrity means everything actually uh, I have a hard time with that one because I know that I I know that I will do a good job but nobody can never say that I own integrity right nobody can never say I'm an honest guy because you can't own that you have to prove it over time but we can do that I guess that's one of the things that I want to, um, one of my points that I want to bring into the Maverick Party, and, and this would probably be one of the more um, bigger differences between Tarek and, and myself, is I want to try and bring recall into, into the Maverick Party. Uh, being able to recall our MPs, even in the middle of an election cycle. and. That is because of a question that was brought to me during the election. I had this one, you talk about High Prairie, there was this one cowboy, this little old cowboy that asked me, <laughs> he said, uh, I like what you say, but you better not disappoint me. You know, and he was speaking to that issue of, of integrity. He says, you're not, the only, you're not the first guy that's ever come through here and, and made these claims. Like, and it speaks to integrity. And so what I had to tell him is, is uh, unfortunately, nobody can claim it. But now we have the ability to maybe go one step further. And that's what recall will be able to do. Uh, if the constituent doesn't like what their Maverick member of parliament is doing, we want to give them the ability to get him out of there. The problem with most recall is that it takes often more votes to get them like out of power than it did to actually put them in power. It's, it's difficult to do. And so I want to make it different. And how it's going to be different is it will be internal at first. So if 2,500 Maverick members in a riding, they all have to reside in that riding, get together and sign a petition of recall it will trigger an internal nomination race within the Maverick Party uh, for that for that MP's seat. He will have to justify to his electorate why he belongs there. Now, should he lose that? Should he lose that that nomination race? According to a contract that he would have had to have signed, that will put penalties in place if he doesn't do them he will have to step back and vacate that seat and that will trigger a by-election. The guy who won the nomination race will then step forward on behalf of the Maverick party and will run in the by-election for that seat. I think he would probably win it because 
the Maverick Party will be the only ones that will offer this ability uh, to not just say that we have integrity, but we'll back it up with teeth. And it's an assurance to all of our voters that we're not just there to get a pension. We're not just there to, uh, you know, do, you know, whatever. I don't know. But I think in order to be a perfect, uh, not a perfect, but to be a good representative, you need to be out on your riding. When was the last time that we saw our members of parliament out in their riding on a regular basis? Uh, no, I don't. I, I don't mean to call anybody out, but I, it doesn't I, seem to I happen will. very often. I will. I've lived in Calgary for two and a half years. I've not seen one member of parliament or one MLA at my door, unless it was an election. Two, when I lived up in Slave Lake for five years, Foster, Alberta. I get again, yeah. former liberal candidate up there. I never saw Honor Arnold Vierson. Yeah. And we that that shouldn't be. I want I want the Maverick MP to be accountable to his electorate. You know, yes, you know, an, an MP is in Ottawa like six months of the year. That that's true from what I understand. That's kind of the number. But when they're home, that doesn't mean that they don't have to be out. They should be doing scheduled meetings, I think. Even if it's just in a coffee shop, I'm going to be in this coffee shop from this hour to this hour. Come and sit down at the table with me so that I can know how you feel, so that I know how to vote when I get to the House of Commons. What do you, what are the issues that I should be bringing up for you? You know, uh, Email is great. We all use that at will, but there is no suit for, for being a, able to be out and about in our writings. And so that is why I know some people are kind of concerned in regards to that. They think that there is a potential for chaos. Um, holds it, people to account. Yeah, it holds people to account. And I think that if our members of parliament, the Maverick members of parliament know their job, they're not gonna have a problem with that. We we'll never have to exercise this ever because our guys will just know what to do. I want, I want our constituents to smile when they say our names. Yeah. So well, that's my, that's my, that's, that's what bitch. I wanna see. Well, Colin, <laughs> I wanna thank you so much for sitting down for the last 55 minutes now and chatting about your leadership views and where you want to take the Maverick Party and your policies. Um, conversations like this need to happen more often. Uh, I think people get stuck behind social media and it's the wrong place to have a discussion, to be honest. I think you're right. Go to the, your local A&W, because I, I remember going to my local A&W in Slave Lake, and I could tell you, if you were getting the news from the day, you were getting at local A&W because that's where all the guys were and they were chatting about what was happening in the community. So I, I say this over and over again, but get out there and have a conversation, people. It, it, I know it may seem challenging for some, but it does help our democracy and it helps us be a better society. Um, but Colin, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Yes. Did you hear? Did you hear any of that? Probably not. Eh? Uh, you cut out. You cut out a little oh, bit. Sorry. No, I, I said thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Oh, uh, it's been my honor, and I, I appreciate every minute of it. Thank you for uh, thank you for being so patient. I know it's been a little while in the in the preparation of making this happen. So thanks. We for got your to sit down. Well. That's all that matters. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great edition. We'll be back tomorrow for another great episode of the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, just keep talking.
So I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great edition of the Crown Sport Interviews with Chris Brown. Uh, I have been Chris Brown, your host. I am pleased and honored to have had Colin on the show. I am pleased and honored to be able to attend the leadership uh, election announcement in uh, Calgary here. And I want to take a moment and just say thank you to the listeners and to the viewers. Over the weekend, we actually passed 500,000 download streams of our show. That's over half a million people tuning in to our show to listen to us jabber on with guests, with the people from all backgrounds, to talk about whatever we want. Because that's right, it's my show and I get to do that. Uh, this is episode 376. I am so happy to bring uh, the next 375 episodes to you. We are going to be going a little bit different than we traditionally have. Uh, we made the decision uh, back in April that we'd be doing 15 episodes a month. I tried to do is 15 episodes, scheduled 15 episodes a month. We might have some live episodes throughout the month but overall 15 episodes each month so that's three weeks of episodes for four weeks and then we'll take a week off every time uh we do have our weekly uh live episodes if you haven't subscribed to our youtube channel these are we're going to be trying to do some more live streaming we're going to be bringing you some more content as we go along so with that i want to thank everyone for tuning in thanks everyone for tuning in for the last 375 episodes i hope you enjoyed 376 and we will be back tomorrow with another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep chatting. Talk to you later.